All right, so this will be the first lecture on neurological disorders. Um, here we're going to look at just kind of the general principles of what we're looking for when we examine the neurological system. Uh, we'll talk about the neurological exam, the neuro exam, uh, different types of imaging techniques to detect neurological disorders, and then uh, kind of a general uh, sort of summary of how we might think about approaching using the therapeutic order uh, neurological disorders. So uh, that's all going to be part of this first lecture. So a neurological disorder is any disorder of the, of the nervous system. Uh, we're going to look at um, mental health and what we might call psychiatric disorders separately. So that's going to be things like depression and anxiety and OCD. Here we're going to look at actual problems of the nerves. So that would include things like cerebrovascular accidents, uh, headaches, uh, seizure disorders, uh, movement disorders, like, and then uh, neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and so forth. Uh, there are over 600 recognized conditions, but we're going to focus in on the ones that are most commonly uh, encountered in kind of primary care or adjunctive care practices. Um, there are a lot of different classification systems. Uh, chapter 6 of the ICD-10 covers neurological disorders. Um, and um, generally for the assessment of the nervous system, this is something that's usually outside the realm of adjunctive care providers like acupuncturists and whatnot. So this is typically performed by either primary care physicians and then more advanced assessments would be performed by neurologists. So um, usually there's an initial screening and if something comes up that's, that's more concerning and needs deeper investigation, a referral is made to a neurologist. Um, typical assessment might include things like a thorough physical exam and that would be including a general exam, looking at vitals, looking at um, heart lung function, uh, palpating the thyroid, maybe an abdominal exam, but specifically it would include the neurological exam. So the neurological exam is a component of a typical physical exam. And I'll talk about the components here as well. Another important part, and we usually classify it as part of the neuro exam or an EENT exam, would be to examine the retina. And this is for anyone where we suspect, for example, increased intracranial pressure. There's some specific changes you can see in the retina. Um, and uh, that might be one place to see that. That's going to be more typical of like an emergency department or something. You'll need to maybe quickly investigate that. Um, the whole purpose is to, of the neuro exam is to really try to identify structural lesions. Um, and um, the exam components looking at motor and sensory aspects can help with that. But typically we use things like MRI and CT and maybe angiography to help uh, narrow down if we suspect there are particular lesions somewhere. Um, in some instances, the cerebral spinal fluid can be examined. So a lumbar puncture is made in the lumbar spine and uh, I'll talk about that later, but uh, the CSF can be withdrawn and we can look for the presence of maybe excessive proteins in the CSF or specifically uh, bacteria, and that could be an indicator of bacterial meningitis. Also, there could be white cells uh, in the CSF, so that's part of a lumbar puncture. Um, can also do things to look at the electrical activity in the brain, and that would be things like the EEG, electroencephalogram, um, and that will give us kind of a gestalt uh, reading of the different portions of the electrical activity in the brain. Very helpful for pinpointing maybe where seizure activities are rising from and so forth. Um, and then there are investigations to examine the peripheral nerves, and that would include EMG, electromyography, where electrodes are placed in muscles and we look for the nerve conduction into the muscle and their activity. Uh, and then there are actual nerve conduction studies to see how the uh, electrical activities conducting along nerves. Um, now the most common sites of neurological lesions, well it's kind of anywhere along the neurological tract, so we would have distinct regions like the cortex, uh, the subcortical areas and the limbic system and whatnot, the cerebellum, the brainstem, and then lesions could affect the spinal cord, um, it could affect the, uh, the spinal nerve roots and then the plexuses that uh, are formed from the spinal roots, uh, that would be called plexopathy. Uh, if it's a problem with the root, for example, if the vertebrae is compressing a nerve root, that's called radiculopathy. And then uh, it could be a problem in the peripheral nerve, that would be a peripheral neuropathy. And then it could be a problem with the neuromuscular junction where the nerve connects with the muscle. Uh, or it could be a problem in the muscle itself, a myopathy. So part of the, the thing with neurological disorders is to really try to pinpoint where the lesions uh, are 
and uh, that's what all these different tests I just mentioned are, are used for. Now, I mentioned the neurological physical exam as sort of a component of a typical physical exam, not always performed unless we suspect there are neurological problems. Um, and that includes, number one, just examination of general appearance. So you make note of the patient's facial appearance, their movements and posture, um, their head. We do a kind of a head examination, just look for asymmetry, any sort of head trauma, etc. cetera. Uh, look at the patient's affect, orientation, and memory. Uh, and that can be tested sometimes through uh, clinical tools like the mini mental state exam. I'll talk about that later. Um, the retinal exam with an ophthalmoscope, again, to look for changes in the retina, which would suggest increased intracranial pressure, like from hydrocephalus. Um, a cranial nerve exam, which would test basically the functions of all 12 cranial nerves. Cranial nerve one, remember, is the olfactory nerve. And that is typically not tested, but you could have someone smell something if you suspected a problem there. Uh, optic nerve, cranial nerve number two, look for, again, with the ophthalmoscope and the retina. Uh, look for perla, which is, uh, means pupils are equal and they're round. Uh, they're reactive to light and there's accommodation, meaning that if you, for example, put your finger at a distance from the patient and have them focus on your finger and you bring it closer to their face, you should notice that the eyes and the pupils accommodate for that. Um, they should turn inward a little bit. So that would be a typical normal finding. So that's called, we abbreviate that as PERLA. Um, and so if you see that in the chart note, you know, PERLA, that means that the patient's pupils were equal, round, reacted to light, and uh, there was accommodation. Uh, and then you test visual fields. For example, put your finger, uh, have their patient track your finger in different visual fields and you see how far to the side of their heads the visual field extends. So that's all part of testing cranial nerve number two. Number three, uh, four, and six, remember ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens. These three cranial nerves innervate the muscles that move the eyeball. Um, and uh, so we do what's called the H and space test. You sort of draw out an H with your finger and you have the patient follow that and you should see normal tracking of the eye and uh, no abnormal movements or deviations. So that's the H and space. Um, uh, with cranial nerve number three, there are sympathetic nerves that also regulate the pupils. So here we again check the light reflex. So that'd be part of PERLA, but you can shine the light in a patient's eye. You should see that they constrict. Um, and so forth. So that's testing cranial nerve number three and then four and six. Cranial nerve number five, the trigeminal nerve. <clears throat> this has, remember, motor to the jaw muscle. So just have the patient cleanse the jaws and then sensory to the face. So just see, you know, touch different parts of the face lightly and uh, have the patient close their eyes so they don't see you doing it and then ask them if they're feeling it when you touch the face. Uh, that's a quick test there. Cranial nerve number seven, facial nerve. Remember, this is the main motor nerve to the facial muscles. So just have them smile. And if the smile is symmetrical and whatnot, if you don't notice any facial drooping and so forth, we say cranial nerve number seven is intact. Remember seven also is innervating the sensory to the anterior tongue. Uh, you could have them taste things on the tongue, but we typically don't do that. Uh, cranial nerve number eight is the auditory nerve. And so here we do what's called the weber rene test. Um, and this is used with a tuning fork, so the patient uh, either listens to the tuning fork right next to the ear or you place the tuning fork the end of it at the top of the skull on the bone and uh, it should vibrate and the patient should hear it equally in both ears. If it lateralizes to one ear then we have to determine if there's a problem of either a conduction defect of the sound. In other words, is the sound not getting into the ear from blocked wax or something like that? Or is um, the nerve and we call that a sensory neural defect, is the nerve not carrying the information. Usually when you put the uh, uh, tuning fork on the top of the head, if it lateralizes to one ear, that usually means there is a conduction defect uh, on that side. It's gonna sound a little bit louder. Uh, and then you can put the tuning fork next to the ear and then you can uh, test that. Um, so that's called the Weber and Rene test. Number nine is the glossopharyngeal. This innervates the pharynx. So in the posterior tongue, so we check the gag reflex. Uh, 10 is the vagus, just have the patient say ah, and you can check the palate, make sure that it lifts. And then the cranial nerve 11, accessory nerve. Uh, check the sternocleidomastoid, best way is just to have the patient shrug their shoulders or turn their head. 
So that also uh, uh, tests that. And then 12 is the hypoglossal. Just have the patient stick out the tongue and you look for potential deviation to one side or another. So that's just a quick run through of the 12 cranial nerves. So we usually do that, it takes a couple of minutes um, if we suspect any problem with the cranial nerves, which is not typical, uh, but that's helpful if, if there is an issue like Bell's palsy or trigeminal neuralgia or something like that. Uh, we then check the spinal nerves and uh, that's both checking sensory. So we're gonna check uh, sensation in different dermatomes and that's usually using uh, a combination of either sharp or dull, so the patient closes their eyes and you have a little probe that has a sharp end and a dull end, and then you alternate and ask the patient what they're feeling at different dermatomes, and so that's one way of checking that. And then muscle strength, uh, you just check the major muscle groups for their strength, and we grade it uh, zero to five. Um, so five would be normal strength, and then zero would be no strength. So we typically look for, you know, um, uh, the, the different strength there. So that's the muscle strength and then we check the stretch reflexes which is reflex testing with the little reflex hammer. So on the the basic reflexes, biceps, triceps, we check the knee, uh, the patellar reflex, and then the Achilles reflex and then maybe the bottom of the foot, the Babinski. So that's uh, all the uh, reflex testing. And then cere the check the cerebellum, we check balance, so just have the patient walk maybe have them close their eyes when they're walking. Um, be sure if you suspect a balance problem, if that's done, to be close to the patient so they don't fall over when they close their eyes. And then you check for coordinated skills, like for example, touching their finger to the tip of their nose quickly, back and forth, or moving their finger from their nose to your finger, back and forth, that checks for coordination. Um, and then to check the cortex, we look for higher things, checking for speech, memory, uh, identification of objects by shape and so forth. So this would all be part of a neuro exam. Usually it takes just a few minutes if you get really skilled at this and uh, this gives really valuable information for identifying neurological lesions. Here's just another page on the neuro exam because it is so important I wanted to kind of emphasize it. Um, the purpose of the exam again is to really localize lesions. We're going to assess sensory and motor neuron responses um, and um, it's going to include the complete history plus this part of the exam. And it's helpful just to see uh, a p p a pictures of people doing this. So there's uh, a really nice guide online. There's several YouTube videos and whatnot. But I found one, University of California, San Diego, has a practical guide to the clinical exam. There's a website, and they have videos on how to perform it. So it might be helpful just to watch that, just to see how a primary care physician would kind of run through this process. So the first part of that, again, is a mental static examination, looking at things like appearance and orientation, person, place, and time. So who are you, where are you, what year is it, kind of thing. Uh, looking at psychomotor behavior, uh, their mood and affect, they look depressed, they look really anxious, do they look psychotic. Uh, their speech, is it really rapid and uh, incoherent, et cetera their cognitive processes, their thought patterns, and then their level of consciousness. And if they're unconscious, we use what's called the Glasgow Coma Scale um, to uh, help us differentiate that. Um, that's typically not gonna be someone walking into your primary care pro uh, practice. If they go unconscious, it's probably a medical emergency that needs to be dealt with. Um, vital signs are a part of this, and then checking for just uh, a meningeal irritation I didn't mention in the last slide there. But this would be looking at what's called a Brzezinski's or Kerning's test. And basically that's where you lift, so the patient's lying down, and you lift their head up, and that's gonna stretch their meninges. And if there's meningitis, it's gonna really cause a lot of pain. And uh, that would kind of confirm there that there's a meningeal irritation. Um, so that is uh, all part of kind of the just general quick exam there. So the write-up might include something like A and O, that's alert and oriented times three, that means person, place, and time. Uh, and then short and long-term memory is intact, so that might be a statement that we write in the chart. Uh, cranial nerve exam, I already t I talked about those. And then in the chart, you might see things like cranial nerve number two, because remember, one is olfactory, we don't usually test that. Cranial nerve two to uh, 12 are grossly intact. And then the motor system, I'm gonna check the muscle strength, again, scale zero to five, uh, five being normal, zero being complete paralysis. So looking for muscle tone, any signs of abnormal rigidity. Look at posture, um, and I'll talk about the cerebet decorticate postures later. And then hemipritic would mean uh, 
but not able to move or paralyzed on one side. And then presence of any resting tremors and then any abnormal movements like seizures, fasciculations, which are little muscle uh, cramps, and then uh, muscle tone, and then again, rigidity. So assuming that's normal, we might write something like strength is five out of five throughout, tone within normal limits. Um, then we'll check the deep, deep tendon reflexes. And again, the big ones here, you don't typically check the masseter, that's sometimes what we do. You know, we just check the strength on the cranial nerve exam um, to check cranial nerve uh, number five. But uh, there is a masseter reflex that can be done with a reflex hammer. But biceps, triceps, the knee, the ankle jerk, and then the plantar reflex called the Babinski. And um, we're going to be looking for, you know, the fact that these reflexes uh, have a normal uh, sort of reflexes. So usually we document that as 0 to 4, and normal would be 2. So plus 2 reflexes uh, would be a normal reflex. 4 would be much higher very hyperactive, and zero would be no reflex. So we're gonna look for under or over activity in the reflexes, and that can be important because signs of upper motor neuron damage, remember upper motor neurons are in the brain and spinal cord, and um, they generally have more of an inhibitory role or they have inhibitory circuits involved. So if there's a lesion of those neurons, but the lower motor neuron, which is what goes from the ventral spinal cord to the muscle, if that's intact, and you check the reflex, people will tend to be hyper-reflexive. But if there's damage to the lower motor neuron, the patients will be hypo-reflexive. So that's uh, just quickly going to tell us if there's an upper or a lower motor neuron disorder. And if you don't know what I'm talking about there, I would go look up, again, the difference between upper and lower motor neurons. Um, so that's checking deep tendon reflexes. Again, checking sensation in the different dermatomes. Uh, can look at light touch, look at, uh, you know, vibration sense, pain with usually the sharp indicator, you don't press that hard, but it can cause a little bit of pain, and so forth. And um, two-point discrimination is putting two probes close to each other and see how closely you can get them together before the patient loses the perception that they're two separate points. So if you do that on the back of the hand, you can actually see that you can get the points very closely together, but on the back, Patients usually can't distinguish two points that are closer than about a half an inch apart, if not, if not more. Uh, and then Romberg test is where you have the patient basically stand, uh, close their eyes, and hold their arms out in front of them, and if you see, make sure they can stay balanced with that. Um, so assuming this is all good, we have, uh, and that's really testing, sorry, the proprioceptors. So balance really is a combination of three factors. We have proprioceptors from the muscles. We have our inner ear apparatus, the semicircular canals, which maintains balance, and then our vision. So we need two out of those three to maintain balance. So if you close your eyes, you're relying on your muscle proprioceptors and your inner ear apparatus. Now, if you close your eyes, hold your arms out in front of you, and you start to sway and you lose balance, that tells us there's a problem at one of those two levels. And uh, if it's a problem at the muscle level, um, that's a sensory problem, so that's why this is part of sensation. So assuming that's all good, we say intact to sharp and dull throughout. And then finally, to test cerebellar function, we look for balance issues. So we look for dysmetria, which is lack of coordinated movement. So that's the finger-to-nose test. So you hold your finger out, they touch your finger, and then they touch their nose quickly. They touch your finger again, touch their nose. Um, and then you can also have them, if they're lying on the table, have them take their ankle and uh, uh, on one foot, so take their heel, and rub it up and down the tibia on their opposite leg. And uh, that actually takes a great deal of coordination, and people that have cerebellar problems can't do that. Um, so those are tests of dysmetria. Uh, dysdiadokinesis is, DDK, is really the impaired ability to perform rapid movements. Um, so that's basically doing things like rapid pronation, supination of the hands. So have have the palm up and then down, back and forth this way. That's another cerebellar uh, task. So that would be disturbed if there's uh, a cerebellar injury. Ataxia is a problem in gait. So just assess their gait as they're walking. And then nystagmus, again, is when you, uh, a rapid movement in the eye. So if they have them look to one side, if there's nystagmus, the eye will oscillate back and forth. Um, and uh, there's many things that can cause nystagmus. That could be an inner ear problem, there could be a brainstem injury. Uh, alcoholism, etc. But uh, that would be testing for that. 
and then looking for intention tremor, which is basically when they go to uh, move, they start to have a tremor versus a resting tremor is when they're at rest and they start to move their arm, for example, and the tremor goes away. So you have to differentiate resting from intention tremor. And then looking at things like staccato speech, um, that's another uh, bra partly brainstem oriented activity, so speech that's very broken. There could be a lot of issues there. Again, remember Broca's and Wernicke's area, if there's strokes that can cause problems there. But all of these could be potential uh, signs of cerebellar injury. We have to, of course, look at the whole history. Um, so the way we uh, document that would be intact finger to nose, gait within normal limits. So this is, again, something if you get skilled at, you can do fairly quickly. And uh, we will do this when we suspect any neurological issues with patients. Now, the neuro exam is the, the first component of working up neurological conditions. If we suspect lesions in the nervous system anywhere, we might need to get some neuroimaging. And uh, this typically, again, would be outside the scope of practice of a, uh, you know, adjunctive care providers. But it would uh, be something to know about, and this would be what the primary care physician might refer uh, on for if they suspected an issue. Uh, so the most common would be MRI. This developed in the uh, early, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, here, you know, the patient lies on a bed. It's moved into the scanner. You've probably all seen MRI machines. Um, very strong magnetic fields are applied to the body. And what that does is it actually aligns all the proton spins on hydrogen atoms. They all line up to the field, and then the field is relaxed. It's turned off uh, momentarily. And then as the protons all go back to their original positions, their spin, uh, they emit radio waves. And those radio waves are detected. And amazingly, that information can be gathered and we can actually get a map of where all the hydrogen is in the body and basically where all the water is. So we're looking at the water structures in the body with uh, MRI. And uh, that gives us pretty clear images of all the different uh, internal structures. So MRI, there's uh, different ways of doing it. You can actually use a contrast agent called gadolinium, which is injected intravenously. And uh, that actually gives better resolution on the MRI. Uh, there are some issues with gadolinium. Some people with, you know, with renal issues and whatnot have a real problem clearing gadolinium, and there's some evidence that might actually accumulate in the body. But um, for the most part, it's, it's used when we need better contrast on the MRI image. Um, so the thing to know about MRI here is that it does not use x-rays. So it's non-ionizing radiation, um, and so it doesn't harm you in the way that a CT or an x-ray would do. Um, and it doesn't have any sort of long-term radiation exposure risk. Uh, some can't tolerate the procedure because you're in this tube and you have these really loud, the magnetic field is that fires, it sounds like a gunfire, and it's super loud, and uh, a lot of people get super claustrophobic and whatnot. Uh, so you can give, you know, anesthetic is sometimes given to relax a patient uh, so they're sedated, uh, things like that, but some people just can't tolerate that. But here, you know, you see in the right-hand image here a good sagittal MRI slice, and we can see very clearly the different brain structures here. So you see the brain stem and the midbrain. You could see the, uh, the, the ventricles here, first and second ventricle. You see the corpus callosum, the cerebellum, and then the cerebrum all on top of that. So um, you'd see very clearly if there are uh, tumors or any sort of, uh, you know, demyelination, things like that which show up on MRI. Um, now, another way of doing MRI is what's called functional MRI. And what that's looking at is the fact that um, uh, oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin have different paramagnetic properties. And so when they're in the MRI scanner, you're gonna see, able to see changes of blood flow to different parts of the brain. So this is often used for functional studies looking at things like, let's see if we have a patient think of something what part of their brain uh, starts using more oxygen? And by assumption, we, we think that the neurons there would be firing more. So we can kind of see what different activities and whatnot, how it fires different parts of the brain. So he, um, you know, the MRI scan is done, and then we often see superimposed on that image these areas, for example, that are lighting up. Um, and that shows you know, these areas are more active. And so that can be a very helpful um, sort of thing to do when we're looking at 
connecting different activities with different parts of the brain. So a lot of this is done in psychology and whatnot. There's some controversy about how accurate this is, um, but um, it's become a fairly standard research tool uh, to, again, connect brain activity uh, and, and structure. Um, okay, resolution is not as, it's limited to about two or three millimeters in terms of accuracy. Um, and it can be helpful also for detecting subtle ischemia, stroke, things like that. So it has other medical diagnostic roles as well. Then we have CT. Um, CT uses x-rays and it takes several different angles of the x-rays of the, of the head. Um, and uh, this is very helpful in the emergency room. So emergency rooms, good thing to know, they don't have MRI scanners, but they do have CT uh, scanners available. So uh, basically, um, if a person has a head injury and we suspect a subdural hematoma or a bleed, uh, here we have evidence of a major stroke in this patient to the right, in this uh, MRI picture. Um, so, uh, sorry, the CT scan. So this uh, can quickly uh, give physicians kind of information about major traumatic injuries or whatnot. Not as good for um, detecting the more subtle, kind of like a tumor or something like that in the brain, but definitely for the, the more severe injuries. Uh, it is ionizing radiation, so this does carry a cancer risk. And uh, the more CTs you get, the increased risk you have. Um, other tests which are not as common and require really specialized equipment, not everyone has it, are positron emission tomography, PET scans. Uh, and this, uh, basically a patient is uh, injected with radioactive tracers. Uh, they have a very short half-life, so they don't stay around the body long. Um, and then uh, the PET scan actually measures the emissions from those tracers. And so this can give us um, really a two or three dimensional image of distribution uh, of blood flow and whatnot through the brain. And so it can show blood flow, oxygen, and glucose metabolism in these different brain tissues. Um, and it can be used for diagnosis of various brain disorders like tumors and strokes and Alzheimer's. That said, it's because it's expensive, you need all the special equipment, it's not as commonly done as definitely as MRI or CT. Now, if there's a problem with the blood vessels in the brain, that's where what cerebral angiography is. And that basically is, um, uh, basically where it allows for detection of things like aneurysms, arterial venous malformations, and so forth. So a catheter is placed in the femoral artery, and a contrast agent is injected into that. And then we take a series of x-rays, basically, uh, of the contrast agents as they spread through the brain's arterial system. So it gives you an image of the circle of Willis and how all the blood vessels, anterior, middle, posterior cerebral arteries are functioning, and so forth. Um, they, there is a risk of stroke, um, and so what uh, is kind of being used now is uh, basically things like MRIs and ultrasound of the carotid arteries and so forth in place of the direct injection of contrast in the brain. Um, so we kind of look at the blood flow going into the brain and so forth. Uh, but that can be very helpful for specific instances when we do suspect a compromise in specific uh, arteries in the brain. Okay, so those are some of the basic uh, neuroimaging techniques. Okay, I mentioned that we can examine the cerebral spinal fluid as well, and that's obtained through what's called a lumbar puncture. Uh, so if you look here, patients are usually lying on the side or they're sitting, uh, and uh, the needle, a local anesthetic is applied to the skin, so you don't feel it on the skin there. And the patient is conscious, so they're not uh, sedated or anything like that. Um, and the needle's inserted uh, usually into um, uh, between uh, L2, L3, and L4. Uh, and if you do that, you remember that the spinal cord actually ends at L2 and becomes the cauda equina after that. So if you insert the needle below L2, there's a lot less risk of actually puncturing the spinal cord, uh, very little risk. And so the needle is inserted as far as the subarachnoid space and then a little bit of CSF is withdrawn, just a few milliliters. Uh, Got to be very careful not to remove too much CSF because that could actually cause problems in the brain where um, the CSF has normally this cushioning effect on the brain and uh, now we're going to have less CSF and that could uh, really create uh, you know, the brain you know, sitting on top of its blood vessels and creating problems there. Uh, it's most frequently used to diagnose uh, CSF infections, so meningitis. 
Uh, but there are also markers in the cerebral spinal fluid that are helpful for diagnosing multiple sclerosis. So you might hear patients that have MS went through a lumbar puncture as part of their diagnostic workup. Uh, can also be used to inject medicines like chemotherapy into the CSF, which would then get into the brain, um, maybe bypassing the blood-brain barrier in some instances. Um, there is pretty high risk of headache after the procedure in about a third of patients, and that's from a drop in the cerebral spinal fluid uh, pressure. We call that a post-dural puncture headache. Um, usually it's best to just lie down for the next day or so, uh, kind of stay mostly still, kind of let the body, the CSF, kind of regenerate itself. Uh, rarely, if the nerves in the cauda equina are nicked or hit, uh, that could create paresthesias. Um, so this is not without risk entirely, but generally if it's performed by someone who's skilled, it's a safe procedure and uh, can be very helpful diagnostically for these conditions. Uh, other procedures would be biopsy. And if you're looking at the brain, that would actually be removing a part of the skull, going in and actually taking a part of brain tissue out. So it would be a brain biopsy. Um, that's helpful for brain tumors to gather information about them. Uh, EEG I talked about. This would be the electrical activity. And uh, very helpful for epilepsy. Also used commonly in sleep clinics for sleep disorders. And then EMG, electromyography, is really measuring the electrical activity uh, in skeletal muscles. And uh, this can tell us if the uh, muscle cells are actually jittering electrical potential. And that might tell us if they're not, that the, maybe they're not getting the right nerve innervation. And uh, that would need further work up there. So basically involves insertion of a very fine needle into the muscle. And uh, then we have an instrument that can actually record the, nerve poten the muscle potentials. Um, so basically detect disorders of both the muscle and the nerve supply to the muscle with an EMG. And then finally, nerve conduction studies. These detect changes in the electrical activity of peripheral nerves, both motor and sensory. And they're often used along with the EMG studies to further kind of pinpoint where is the problem. Is it in the muscle or is it in the nerve? Um, here, the electrodes are placed on the skin. Um, and uh, the nerve is then stimulated with a small electrical impulse. And then we look at what's called the nerve conduction velocity is measured at the downstream electrode. Um, so that can be used for determining a variety of different nerve disorders like carpal tunnel, what's called cubital tunnel, which happens at the elbow, um, and then uh, Guillain-Barre, we'll look at that, and then peripheral neuropathies and spinal disc herniation, and then ulnar neuropathy, et cetera. So all of these would be um, uh, helped in their workup with nerve conduction studies. So that's pretty much it for the basic testing. Uh, that we use to work up different neurological disorders. Again, this will be done after the full history and the uh, neurological exam, and uh, typically we're not going to be doing all of these on any patient, but uh, depending on their condition, they might warrant one or a couple of these. All right, so before we jump into any specific neurological disorders, I want to say a little bit about the, the general approach to treatment and how we can think about using the therapeutic order here. Um, so remember the therapeutic order really is uh, our approach to patients to uh, integrate not just the typical biomedical kind of uh, treatments, but also more treatments we see in preventative or integrative medicine and so forth. So um, level one of the therapeutic order, remember, is just establishing general conditions for health through diet, through specific exercise, sleep hygiene, um, and then stress reduction. And uh, that would also include with the diet things like removing alcohol, uh, maybe lifestyle things like cutting down cigarettes and so forth. So that's level one therapies. Uh, at the far end of that, level four would be our typical medical therapies. So that would be uh, things that, again, adjunctive providers, integrated providers that aren't primary care are probably going to need to refer to a PCP or a neurologist. Usually we do a referral to a PCP first. Of course, if it's an urgent condition like a stroke or something, we refer immediately to the uh, emergency department. Um, and so things like physical therapy, rehabilitation therapy, but then specific pharmaceutical therapy would be all part of level four, and then surgery, neurosurgical techniques, and so forth would be part of level four. Um, in between, though, we have a couple other levels that we can address. So level two would be essentially supporting the neuroendocrine immune system, supporting the organ systems, and general homeostasis. So a lot of neurological issues, uh, a good example would be seizures, 
we tend to think of them as focal overactivity of uh, neurons in a specific part of the brain. Uh, if it covers the whole brain, we call that global uh, seizure activity. But basically, we do know that seizure activity can be triggered by metabolic changes, uh, changes in blood sugar, uh, hormone dysregulation, and things like that. So level two would be looking at, is there anything there that we can address? Um, so in this example, the seizure patient, you know, looking at their blood sugar metabolism through their liver, uh, looking at their adrenal steroids and how they're functioning and so forth. Um, we can look at things like headache disorders as being tied in maybe with digestive problems and so forth. So this would all be under level two therapies. And that would include using our modalities like herbal therapy, acumoxa for acupuncture, glandular therapy, maybe for naturopaths and whatnot, homeopathy, uh, people use flower essences, light, sound therapy, etc. would all be part of level two therapies. Uh, and often these are given via pattern differentiation. So we have to look at different organs. What is the state of that organ? In Chinese medicine, we might think of things like liver yang rising, uh, liver qi constriction, you know, kidney indeficiency, et cetera. And uh, the, the biomedical community, we might think of things like low estrogen states, uh, glycogen storage problems, or getting hypoglycemic at night, and that's uh, triggering stress hormones, and that might trigger abnormal brain activity and so forth. So these would all be level two therapies. Level three would be replacement therapy, and that would be replacing to physiologic levels things like hormones, which would be a big part of that. So hormone replacement. So patients with, uh, I should actually have that on there, but yeah, hormone replacement therapy would be one. So thyroid replacement, things like that um, for patients who are hypothyroid. Lots of connections with hypothyroidism, different neurological conditions. So that would be should be on there. But then uh, specific vitamin therapies, mineral therapies, fatty acids. Uh, so if you look at neurological disorders, the B vitamins are enormously important for proper neurological function, including B1, B6, uh, B12. Uh, the active form of B6 is something called P5P, paradoxal five uh, um, paradoxine. So that's P5P. And then uh, folate, uh, methylfolate is often very important here and so forth. And then different minerals like magnesium uh, and zinc have sort of a calming activity on nerve function. Uh, iron is sometimes needed. There's, uh, remember the basal ganglia, it's very rich in iron. It makes all the dopamine and so forth. They're via iron dependent enzymes. And uh, so in conditions like restless leg syndrome, uh, low iron actually can trigger restless legs. So that's something uh, regulated by the basal ganglia and that's due to iron deficiency. Iodine for proper thyroid function. Very important not to overdose on iodine. Our typical recommended, and again, replacement means to physiologic levels. Uh, typical physiologic needs are between 150, 250 micrograms, not milligrams, micrograms, which is like one kelp tablet a day, uh, or a little bit of miso soup with seaweed in it per day. That gives you plenty of iodine. And then lithium is an interesting agent uh, we usually use lithium, we'll talk about this pharmaceutically, um, it's used for uh, bipolar disorder and we're not exactly sure how it works but it t tends to have a down-regulating role on the mania in bipolar, it tends to just calm the nervous system and um, so we now, that's using very high doses of lithium which can actually be toxic to the thyroid and the kidneys. Uh, but we now see in the nutraceutical industry people using very, very low dose, so like five milligrams. The uh, typical uh, pharmacologic ranges go up into the hundreds of milligrams for lithium. So, but the very low dose lithium orotate, five, 20 milligrams, often see for, you know, just management of low grade psychosis and so forth. Again, part of the therapeutic order is to decide where does a patient need the intervention at this moment. So. Some of our patients who are in, you know, let's say bipolar mania uh, and so forth, are gonna need to jump to level four. Some of our patients with more severe neurological conditions, which we'll get into here, definitely cerebral vascular accident, but maybe if they're having seizure disorders, uh, unexplained headaches and so forth, these all might need level four workup and therapy. And then we can back down in our other levels of the therapeutic order. So just clinically always have this in the back of your mind. Um, a couple other things on level three, uh, fatty acids have been found to be very helpful for different conditions, uh, ADHD for example. So DHA is a 22 carbon 
uh, unsaturated uh, omega-3 fatty acid. It's derived from EPA, which is in fish oil. Um, and uh, DHA seems to be kind of a preferential fatty acid for brain development and so forth. Uh, phosphatidylserine is another fatty acid, uh, a lipid, which is very helpful for calming excessive cortisol responses and, again, protecting the brain from stress and so forth. Uh, and then there are different amino acids, for example, tyrosine. If we increase intake of tyrosine, that, that would increase in, in uptake or synthesis of dopamine and norepi and epi. And then tryptophan, uh, and especially in the form of 5-HTP, would increase serotonin. Again, the abbreviation for that is 5-HT. And then GABA supplements. Interestingly, GABA, uh, we don't think crosses the blood-brain barrier, but somehow by ingesting it, it triggers, probably via the vagus nerve, triggers GABAergic neurons in the brain to secrete more GABA. So that's kind of interesting, but we can use that. And then L-theanine, uh, both GABA and L-theanine are non-protein-making amino acids. Remember, we have 20 uh, protein-making amino acids, and um, the GABA and L-theanine are non-protein-making amino acids, um, but they have definite roles. So we know GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter, L-theanine is found in green tea, um, and this upregulates GABA. So we're seeing a lot of people using L-theanine supplements out there for anxiety and insomnia and things like that. And then others we think uh, could be helpful for the brain. Some of these actually work with mitochondria to help the brain make more energy. And so that would be uh, things like alpha lipoic acid, coenzyme Q10, L-carnitine, which helps to shuttle fatty acids into mitochondria to uh, help them make energy. Uh, and then acetyl L-carnitine, we actually think gets into the brain a little bit better. Uh, and then s methionine is another one here. It's a methyl donor. Um, there are compounds called nootropic agents. Nootropics are cognitive enhancers. There's a lot of them out there. If you just go on to Google or go to Wikipedia, they have a whole page on nootropics. Um, but these are things to, for example, prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine, they improve synaptic signaling, and so forth. So these would be nootropic agents. Um, different disorders, like, for example, migraine, there are specific B vitamins and magnesium that have all been shown to be helpful, so B2, uh, B3, B6, B12, magnesium. And then we know for neuropathies that uh, alpha lipoic acid, carnitine, B1, and B12 are often indicated. So this would be another level of uh, intervention, kind of using more of the nutraceutical therapies. Again, attempting to do physiologic replacement. Now, some of these are given in much higher than physiologic levels. And that's where we're, we're kind of getting into, we might think about that getting into level four kind of therapy. I remember level four generally has more of a suppressive effect on physiology versus level two, we're trying to stimulate a physiologic process. So, um, um, some of that crosses over into level four. But these would be the three levels, to four levels to think about. And again, for adjunctive care providers, level four is gonna be a referral. And so it's always important to know when we need to make that referral. And we'll be looking specifically at red flag conditions that would kind of tell you, okay, it's time to make that referral. And then we can work with that patient in the future uh, with a level one through three. All right, so that summarizes it for kind of the intro to neurological disorders. And in the next lectures, we'll start jumping into specific conditions.